Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video of Horizontes Project. My name is Armando Minjares here, the director and curator of the project, Horizontes Project. And we are joined today by some of our canvassers for the project. I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves um, and tell us who they are and, and how they got involved with Horizontes. Anybody can go. Andy, go. <laughs> Hey, uh, well, I'm, I'm Andy Parrish. Uh, I was the uh, canvassing lead for the Horizontis project. And uh, yeah, I, I've worked on various different uh, social justice projects and organizing projects over the years. So. Great, thank you. Okay, Tadana, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Tadana Neal. I was on the canvassing team for Horizontis project. I um, have been in the community uh, on several different boards, but also just doing a lot of community service work. Lewis? Yeah, and my name's Lewis Goslin, um, born and raised in Wichita, a longtime community organizer, and uh, assisted with engagement coordination with the Orizontes Project. Great, well, thank you everyone. Yeah, so today we want to talk about the, um, the big community engagement piece of the project, right? Um, most people, when they hear about Horizontes, they might think about the big Brenna Levero mural. Maybe they think about the murals on the, on the train bridge, or maybe the ones around the, the Dunbar Theater, perhaps. But a lot of people don't know that we did a pretty extensive community engagement process through Horizontes, where we had canvassers like yourselves who were out knocking on doors. And uh, we came up with this survey, right? We, we had help through um, some uh, local academics who were experts on community psychology and helping us understand how to build a, a good survey that would get us good data. And, and then all of you were deployed to knock on doors, to go to community meetings, to set up tables and booths during um, fairs and, and, and festivals. Um, so let's, let's and, and, and the, the purpose of it was to really to, to get a good idea of what people need in their neighborhood and what people want, right? Basically quality of life. Uh, really measure what that what that looks like for the north and the northeast communities. Um, but tell us about um, your experience uh, knocking on doors. Just you know, what was it like for you to get a clipboard or you know a little iPad and then go out knocking on doors? What was that like? Well, it was um, my first time canvassing, actually. So um, I was a little nervous at first, but uh, once I hit like the first or second door, it became something that was very familiar and actually uh, made me feel like I was a little bit more of a, a part of my neighborhood. Um, I grew up a little sheltered and I stayed in the house a lot and um, actually getting out in my own neighborhood and canvassing and talking to everybody one-on-one uh, -on -one helped me um, really feel a part of the neighborhood. Right, so do you feel like it was like a reintroduction to your own neighborhood in a way? It was. It was um, more of a different perspective. And so, yeah, it was enriching. Great, great. Andy, what about you? You've been in the North End for a minute now, uh, involved in different social justice projects in the neighborhood. What was it like to be out there knocking on doors? Um, honestly, it was really, um, it was really educational for one um, to get to talk to just like a good cross section of all the different people that live in the neighborhood and get to hear about like their firsthand experiences and, and what they really think is you know, you can have your assumptions sometimes of what you think people might think or, or want, um, but actually getting to hear it from them is, and, and getting to hear about their experiences um, was just really great. And so it made me feel more connected to the neighborhood because I didn't grow up here, um, but I've been here for several years and it just deepened my love for the place. Yeah, great. Thank you. 
Now, Louis, you've been at it for a minute now, especially when you were here in Wichita doing uh, grassroots community organizing. Tell us more about um, maybe some of the work that you have done in the North End, the Northeast communities, and why? Why, why, why go to the door? Why you know, do, do meetings on, on a, somebody's driveway or somebody's backyard? What's the value in that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been said, like, um, you know, that that you can make assumptions about what a community needs and wants, but you don't really know until you're talking to the people that live there. And for me, I think that, you know, whether it's the past work of engaging people around neighborhood revitalization in the northeast part of town, or, you know, engaging people in uh, in this project around, um, you know, just exactly what they want to see in their community. You don't really know unless you're talking to, you know, everyone that's there. Uh, even if you live there, or even if you're from the neighborhood, until you fully engaged with folks, um, you know, you can't really say uh, what the community wants. But I think that, you know, something that was so good about this project and something that was uh, uplifting for me in, in hitting doors and talking to people was uh, seeing folks who may kind of like drag themselves to the door, who's at my door, you know, I wasn't expecting anyone. And then you just start asking them like, you know, what's your favorite memory in this in this neighborhood? Like, what's one thing that you would like to see? What's one thing that you miss? And you realize that like, despite what your assumptions are, you're going to learn something new. And regardless of what you think it may be needed or important, like someone's going to share something different with you. And, and I feel like for me, every time you hit a door and you get that, the luck of someone actually opening it and engaging you, like you're actually opening a whole new level of understanding of, of what's happening in that community. So um, for me personally, it's enriching just to be able to have that opportunity to get a deeper understanding of a place that I feel like I know, uh, but only to have that knowing challenged and expanded into something completely different. So, um, yeah, I can't beat it and uh, can't really know it unless you're unless you're talking to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, so on, uh, again, it's um, you never know until you actually talk to people. It's it's actually that simple, right? Um, uh, I want to hear more about, especially for those of you that grew up in those neighborhoods, and I mean, all of you really have uh, roots in, in, in the North End or, or Northeast communities, um, but I want to hear just more personal, what was it like for you growing up there or when you moved there and living there and, and finding community? What was that like, you know, to, uh, to be from a place? And anyone can go. Well, um... I feel like I have a couple of different perspectives of community um, growing up on the Northeast side of Wichita. Um, I, like I said, I grew up sheltered. And so um, my community was more um, the black church community. And I grew up in that. And um, it was very tight knit. We all had each other's backs. Um, and we just kind of, you know, grew up um, with a sense of like we were loved and uh, we care for each other. Um, fast forward to when I'm an adult and I, I'm stepping out of my, my house to become engaged um, with people more one-on-one, -on -one, I, um, I actually became a little bit more aware of the cultural side of my community. And that was um, very enlightening and important to me and actually still a part of the journey that I'm on right now. But if it wasn't for actually going out and knocking doors and becoming more acquainted with the elders in my community and, and seeing um, that there was more to this thing that we call community, um, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Oh, that's really powerful. And I think you speak to the different uh, layers, right, that we have um, and the community, the different communities that we belong in um, and, and, the, and what, the, that, what that brings to us. Um, now, Andy, you've been uh, running the North End for a minute and, like you said, uh, working on different social justice projects. Uh, tell us a little more about some of the work that you have done and maybe some of the most rewarding work you have done in the North End uh, neighborhood. Gosh, um, so of the 
projects that come to top of mind, like I've done um, uh, a couple of projects around uh, trying to promote uh, voter registration, especially amongst uh, those formerly incarcerated uh, people with felony records, because um, I mean, it's more common knowledge now, but at the time it was less well known that when people, um, you know, are, are done with their debt to society that they can vote again. Um, and so that is pretty close to my heart. Um, and also uh, with a little bit of local criminal justice reform, um, trying to lessen penalties and uh, get closer to decriminalization of uh, marijuana possession, for example. So uh, those are a couple of other things that I've worked on in the neighborhood. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say what um, is the most rewarding um, they're just all a little bit different. Um, the experiences I had with Horizontes, um, you know, not, uh, just with the, the team of, of great people, um, but getting to, to go around and, and really understand my neighborhood better, um, this, this neighborhood that has welcomed me, um, since I've been living here the last eight years or so. Um, yeah, there's something priceless about that, so. Sorry, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but yeah, totally. No, you totally did, and and you brought up uh, I think a couple of important um, elements in in the story that we're trying to tell, and and it is uh, some of the the barriers, right, that, that a lot of the people that that have lived in, in those neighborhoods have had for a long time, um, because of this legacy of divestment and and lack of access to resources, whether it be having schools that have enough funding uh, and, 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 and you know, the resources that they need or the legacy of redlining, right, with home ownership and the ability to, um, to have that kind of generational wealth that they can really help you have access, right, to, to all sorts of things. All of that has been in those neighborhoods, right? We, uh, we had a, um, really a, a high police presence for a long time. Um, I think that gang activity really was scapegoated as a way to um, to increase that that police presence, which has led to the criminalization of a lot of people. Um, also, these are neighborhoods that have a high population of undocumented immigrants, which which adds to that uh, also criminalizing of, of individuals, and all of, all of those things have an impact in, in how a community on the fabric of a community and how it, it is able to thrive or it continues to stay stagnant. Uh, and, and, you know, thinking about the importance of voter registration, right? And, and contrasted with the legacy of disenfranchisement, right? Of people of color in this country, uh, or um, thinking about criminal justice reform and being, like you said, being able to, to let people know that if you left, you know, if you're out of prison and have a felony, that you are able to be registered to vote. You can't be, part of, of this um, democratic process. Um, or, you know, fines become a huge issue, right? If you get a, um, a, a speeding ticket and you're not able to pay it, you know, and then there's all the court fees, and then it just kind of keeps piling up. And before you know it, you might have thousands of dollars, right? Which might lead to a suspended license and even more fees. And it's sort of this spiraling that, that really keeps a lot of people from being able to fully integrate and, and to thrive. So I think all, all of those pieces are part of the largest story, right? But also um, it's important to highlight, like you were saying to Donna, it's that these communities are thriving, right? There are so many good things happening. Often the perception from the outside is that um, that people don't wanna be in those neighborhoods, that people are you know, really struggling or they just, you know, that, that uh, there's poverty and then there's crime. But something that, that we found out through this canvassing and through the data, uh, when Dr. Ike uh, gave us a report, once you look through all the data we collected, it's that, in fact, people want to live in those neighborhoods. People are happy in those neighborhoods, right? The data told us that, right? The people want to be there. They want to stay there. They have roots. Some of them have been there for multiple generations. Um, and that all they want is more resources. They want better parks, they want better schools, 
and they want opportunities for them to open up businesses and, and to keep their, their circular economy in there. Um, so again, it's perception versus reality, right? These neighborhoods have a stigma, right? And that's that's known, right? That's no secret in Wichita that you know they have seen that, that they are seen in a certain way. Uh, but people want to live there, right? People want to stay there. So that's um, all of it is connected. There's a connecting thread through it all. Um, but okay, so now let's talk about. Um, I want to kind of want to take you back to uh, your there on a sidewalk, walk in right with your clipboard, talking to people. Is there a story that kind of comes to mind that stuck with you? Maybe it was a conversation. Maybe it was something that happened with your other Canvas and peers. Maybe it was with one of the pieces of art that we, you know, that was created through the project. What is the memorable moments um, that you can share with us and with the people watching this video? And anyone can go first. Um, I would say uh, what sticks out to me about our um, journey through the neighborhood as canvassers was um, one of the wins we uh, most currently have in our neighborhood today, which would be the McAfee pool, then McAdams pool. Um, at that time, we when we were knocking doors, we were able to actually in real time discuss um, issues and our community with each and every individual that we spoke to. And if they didn't know about it, we were able to make them aware of it. And um, we were able just to engage the neighborhood and um, uh, allow them to participate in the decision making um, or part we were part of the people that disseminated inf information so people knew about um, this issue. Uh, fast forward to today, we now have um, a pool, which is in large part to the, the, the organization that helped um, get the children down to City uh, Hall and, and, and activate their voices. Um, but I remember being uh, talking to our residents one-on-one -on -one about the importance of what we were doing as far as collecting data um, and, and making them aware that their voices count. Um, and then we see that in real time today, you know, our voices count. Um, you just need to be persistent and, um, and tell people what you want, stay on it, and then um, you'll get what, hopefully you get what you want. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great story. Um, it's I love it when we can actually see the progress in real life, right? We don't have to wait three decades to see yeah. something change. Um, and I think that helps with that momentum where people are able to see um, things physically, vis you know, visibly change in the neighborhoods. So thank you for that story, Tadana. And, uh, uh, yeah, Andy, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say that that... Um... You know, I, I guess to just, just to kind of piggyback off of that a little bit, um, you know, I, I don't remember uh, specific names or anything like that, but mm -hmm. I remember, you know, what Tadana was talking about that we would, you know, go in Canvas and disseminate this information about, you know, this is when this meeting is going to happen um, and, and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, we would come across people that had no idea uh, what was going on, but were, once they knew, were very passionate about wanting to be involved. And then, you know, a few days later at that meeting, I would recognize that person. You know, that, that happened multiple times. So we, I would actually see that person be like, oh yeah, I remember telling that person about this meeting um, and getting to see them like passionately engage um, with advocating for their neighborhood was just really great. That's amazing. I mean, what that shows is that this kind of engagement works, right? When we, uh, when we, uh, the, the fact that, that you recognize these people and they're showing up, it, it's telling us that it works. Um, when we think about a democracy, I think we often just think about showing up to the ballot box, right? Which is important, uh, but there's so many more, there's so much more to, to, uh, a participatory democracy where you can be engaged in so many different ways and you are able to have an impact in how you change your community beyond just a ballot box right with showing up to the city council meetings uh showing up to all these neighborhood meetings uh and and talking about 
being the squeaky wheel, right? Maybe there's 20 squeaky wheels showing up to each meeting. Um, that makes a lot of noise, right? That's a lot of squeaky wheels. Um, either they're going to put oil on it or it's going to fall off. And then who knows what's going to happen after that. <laughs> but that was a great story. Thank you, Andy, for sharing that. Louis, do you have any memorable moments from your time with Horizontes? Yeah, I was just going to share, you know, um, when I, you know, growing up in Wichita, it was always, um, you know, we always lived in rentals. And, um, and I think something that too often gets assumed um, by looking at data is that um, people who, you know, aren't homeowners don't have stake in the neighborhood. Um, people look at owner occupied versus rental. And I just remember going to this guy's door and it looked like he may have been having a rough morning. And <laughs> I started asking him some questions and, you know, we, I asked him about like how long he's been in the neighborhood and does he own his home and, and kind of, you know, what are some of his memories? And what he shared with me is that although he and his family rented for decades they had lived in the same small radius like that ownership was there they wanted to live in the north end um, that was their commitment that was their home and the depth of what he was able to share in terms of how they interfaced and, and, and worked with their neighbors and what their experiences were um, I feel like is something that doesn't get told by looking at raw numbers you can look at you know, how people are doing with jobs or poverty or home ownership, all of this statistical data. But what you don't get is how it works day to day, neighbor to neighbor, person to person, and what folks actually do to, to make it work for them. And so um, I love that, you know, this project opened an opportunity for people to show up. But I also especially love that this project showed up where people were at to be able to like bring them into that process, even if it was at their front door. Um, because so often, like, unless that's happening, like those voices, those stories don't get told. Um, so, so yeah, for me, it was just like that instance of realizing that like, yeah, this person may be month to month, but his presence in this community and his family's presence in the community is generation to generation. And there's a lot to be learned by that. Um, but it only happens if you're actually right there, person to person digging in. So that's, yeah, for me, that's what it's all about. And, and uh, that, that, those are always the best experiences. And that particular morning was, was a great one. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. I love hearing that. Yeah, and, and thank you for bringing up that point, right? That just because you live in a rental, that doesn't mean that you don't have ownership of, of that space and that neighborhood and that community. Now, shifting a little bit, um, so Horizontes ultimately is a community-based art project. And as such, we did a lot of public art, right? We had about 20 murals that were painted between um, the Dunbar district and the Nomar district uh, in the Northeast and North End communities, respectively. Um, what is a piece of art that, that was created through Horizontes that is a favorite of yours and why? I think I have an idea, but I want to hear from you. Uh, well, I, I like um, the murals that are over in the Dunbar area. Um, I think mainly I see them a lot. Um, so the one that's uh, on the back of Dunbar uh, with the comedians and the familiar faces uh, yeah. in history. And then, uh, you know, on the other side is uh, the mural of Martin Luther King. Um, I always enjoy those when I ride by them. Um, and I also um, frequent the 13th Street area too. So whenever I'm crossing underneath that uh, bridge, I see the murals that are done there. So it reminds me of the project when I did. I, I, I still hear people talking about the, the elevator grain. And the reason I like um, that one, and it, it's on, I feel like it's still at the top of my list is because uh, you know people on there. So yeah. I, people from the neighborhood are on the grain elevator and it's, <laughs> and it's done in such a cool way. And uh, yeah, it's, I like that one. 
Awesome. Let me just ask you another question. Um, you are a mother, right, Tadana? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean to you as a mother to, for your child to see public art, murals with people that look like them? I mean, it means a great deal. Uh, representation matters. And so to be able to ride around your neighborhood and see faces like you um, is important. Uh, my son actually just got a chance to participate in another mural um, on the north side. So um, he was able to have his hands on something that um, that he can be proud of. And another thing that um, looks like him, but later in, when he gets older, um, he's gonna be able to say, you know, I did that, you know, and then he's gonna have some stakeholder. And so he, he's already getting a little stakeholdership into the, the community. So I think that's gonna help with um, helping him realize that the community does belong to him and that he does have a voice um, right here where he lives. That's really awesome. Is that by chance the Maya Angelou Library yes. mural? Great. Yes, it is. That's awesome. Just side note, the two artists there, uh, Priscilla Brown, she painted right the mural on, behind the Dunbar Theater. And then Quintus Pinkston, he was our main assistant at the big Grand Elevator mural. So both right. of them are great accomplished artists that have deep roots in the neighborhood and they've been killing it doing amazing artwork so i encourage everyone to go out to the maya angelo library over on 21st street and hillside to look at the mural and to maybe pick up a book that's right <laughs> awesome thanks for sharing that Tadana. what have you and do you do you have a favorite piece of art from horizonte as a favorite mural oh i'm i'm terrible at picking favorites of, of any kind. Uh, I know. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, the ones at the 13th Street train bridge are the ones that I see most often and are uh, hmm, prob probably my favorites. Um, the, the one at Evergreen is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, gosh. Yeah, They're all so good. Yeah, they really are. And and there's just there's such a variety of styles like yeah. um you know, I mean, you could spend a day, you know, multiple days just going around like hunting down all the murals that were uh, related to this project and uh just, you know, admiring the work and the the messages in the artwork and it's yeah, it's <sighs> Yeah, 13th Street. And I don't make me pick amongst the ones that <laughs> all together. On there. I'm just going to say the 13th Street Bridge ones. Awesome. Thank you. Don't, don't make me pick for Pick them. one. I know. Okay. What about you, Lewis? You don't have to pick either, but maybe one that you enjoy a lot. <laughs> well, I think, um, yeah, like having first gotten involved with organizing at a really young age and working in the Northeast community, I feel like. Um, yeah, like it felt powerful to see what was happening uh, in the in the Dunbar area, just because of historically, like what that like strip represents, um, and it felt like a reclamation, like a like a yeah, like the community kind of lifting up, not only lifting up that history, but also like claiming that space for the future. And so for me, like just the the power of of what decades of redlining and like yeah just racist policies in terms of like investment and economic development and community infrastructure and how it just you know really decimated and attacked that core that vibrant core to see that vibrancy reemerge um, and, and be, and, and start to take root through, you know, not just the project, but all of the efforts that are going on in the community right now. I feel like that made like what was happening there and in, in that visual representation, all the more powerful for me, um, kind of rolling in one day and seeing like people putting in work. So, um, I, I would say, yeah, in terms of not a particular mural, but just it, just seeing the project really do its thing in the community, it felt most powerful there. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, with just, um, I mean, of course I love all of them, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
it's it, it's I asked that question like and you're right Andy like it's it's hard to pick one right of anything that it's your favorite um, because there are so many great story to touch them right the, the the meaning it's so deep for and so different for different people but I, I always love to hear um, sort of what people are thinking about right when they interact and live around you know this uh, this type of art. Um, a quick update on, on those projects, because we did focus on the Dunbar Theater and the Nomar Theater as sort of these hubs uh, and, and catalysts for community reinvestment and development. Uh, there's been some uh, some movement since. I mean, Tadana, you already mentioned the, the huge investment in uh, McAfee Pool, formerly known as McAdams Pool. They just announced uh, another, I believe it's $8 million investment in the rec center there. There will be the Carl Brewer um, Community Center, which will also be another catalyst for development of entrepreneurs and education activities, et cetera. Uh, and then um, the, the uh, Dunbar Theater, right? They've got a four phase uh, renovation project. They're on phase one already, really getting it ready for people to be inside the space and use it. Uh, you know, they've got over a million dollars raised, which is great, and, and they're just going to continue to get those dollars in. I mean, there's still a lot of challenges, right, with making sure that there's a, that they're filling in all the empty space around it. But um, it's huge to have that level of money being invested in those spaces. And then with Nomar, they just launched a new um, nonprofit organization, Empowered Evergreen, which is currently working out of the Evergreen Community Center. And we'll soon move to the Evergreen Library. And they're focusing uh, similar to what's happening at um, McAdams. They're going to be focusing on entrepreneurship and job readiness uh, for the community. Um, there's a, a local family who are philanthropists who purchased the Nomar Theater and donated it to Evergreen. So now there's plans of um, renovating it, put it in a historical registry. And hopefully, it becoming this uh, this catalyst all, again for entrepreneurship and and uh, and job readiness and 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 other um, priorities that they have identified. So it's it's exciting to see that in the last two years, um, the needle has continued to move. I think it's important, you know, going back to to the reason we're here talking with this group in this process. I believe it's important that we continue to stay connected. Uh, to the community and keep our ear on the ground, right? Um, it's great to have this investment, but at the same time, we must ensure that people there are prioritized, right? That that this investment doesn't lead to further displacement, but it, but that it instead it, it helps uh, solidify the people that live there and to expand the opportunity to them and to their kids and, and their future generations. Um, so again, uh, we're out of time now. I just want to take another you know, few seconds to thank all three of you for joining us today and this weekend and to share and sharing about uh, the work that you did for Odiso and this is some of the takeaways that you had with the project. Um, uh, you can follow us on social media at Odisantis Project or odisantis-project.com. Uh, we will be dropping uh, these videos in the next few months, and we're excited to, to continue to grow this community resource um, and, and to continue to learn about uh, the amazing people that we have here. Again, I thank you for your time and your commitment, and I'm excited to see uh, what's in your horizon. You don't have to tell me, but I'm just excited. Whatever it is, I'm excited to, to, to see what that will become. Again, thanks, everyone, and for those watching. Uh, Click on the next video, I guess. <laughs>